Multiple key for single lock, it's common. But can we have multiple locks but one key? Yeah, it's also possible. All we need to do is manufacture multiple lock and configure this key to work with those locks. Now we can distribute these locks everywhere and then we can access the information or objects or things which are locked using this just one key. And in this session, let's learn how to design distributed locks. Before we going to uh, design, we had to also learn the basics of locks, mutex, and semaphore. You guys would have learned all of these things in your academics, right? Let's go back and remember all of this stuff. Locks and mutex are a little bit similar. All we need to remember is locks are used to lock critical section from threads of the same process usually. But whereas mutex allows us to lock a critical section or an object or a file or anything from multiple processes or threads which are running in multiple process, that's the basic difference. And coming to semaphore, there are like two or multiple types of semaphore. The basic thing which we, uh, which we use semaphore is to allow particular group of uh, accessors or threads to access a particular critical section. And also there are something called as counting semaphores where these are used to count the number of accessors who are accessing the critical section or a particular, particular resource. One example is in Chrome, uh, per host name we can have maximum of six or seven connections only. We can actually use semaphores to count how many connections are open for that particular host name from that given tab. Whereas in Mutex, the good example will be, say there are multiple processes running in your machine or operating system in which all of these threads or processors are trying to log information or log the log lines into one file. That's when we need to lock uh, the file, write or read to do anything. Without further delay, let's go to our whiteboard and start designing the distributed lock. Back in 1990s, every website used to run from a single powerful machine. We used to scale vertically. That means we used to upgrade the same machine to make it much powerful to serve a lot of traffic or to store a lot of data in it. And these days, because a lot many people are using internet services, we can't just do the same thing now. We have to do horizontal scaling. That means that we have multiple servers working for the same purpose or for the same website. Say, for example, I have a website. I can't just serve information for the same website from the same single server. If more number of people are coming into my website, obviously they are saving more amount of data. That means that I'll have to do horizontal scanning. Request can be served from any of these machines. We usually call these kind of systems as distributed systems. Let's take an example and understand how exactly distributed systems work and why exactly we need distributed locking mechanism. In this example, let's take, there are four different instances which are available in our distributed system, for, which, is, which we have for a specific website. This machine is in different part of the world and this machine is also in different place. Say for example, this is in America and this is in Asia somewhere and this is in Africa and this is in Australia. Okay. Now what these machines are trying to do is we have some data which is stored at one place. Say for example, these are some log files or something. Okay. And what, what is the job of these machines is to read these log files and figure out some, some information or some useful information and write back those information into some other place, into some different files. Say, for example, uh, each individual files output will be stored into each individual files here. Say, for example, I have three files here, one dot data, two dot data, and three dot data and the output will be also saving one dot out two dot out and three dot out okay now on an ideal situation every instance will pick up one one file and then they processes it and then every instance saves the output into respective uh, files uh, name dot out so if this guy picks up one dot data and he writes into one dot out, and if this guy picks up two dot data and then he writes to two dot out, 
Now everything works fine, but not always. Now what if this machine picked up one dot data file and this guy or uh, this instance which is in Asia also picked up the same file. That is now both are working on the same file itself. Say that is one dot data and this guy is also working on one dot data. And once they finish it, they both write the output into the same file. We sense a lot of problem here. There is unnecessary, um, two machines are working on the same file. It's unnecessary, right? That's what the first problem is. How do you make the system efficient? We don't want two machines to pick up the same file and process it and give the output. It's fine. It's not just fine. It says just one machine should pick up that file and then process it. It's not okay for two machines to uh, work on the same file because it just increases the server cost and it just takes more time to finish our job. And the next problem is integrity. What does integrity mean? It's the correctness of the output or correctness of the file which is which we have. What Since these two files, these two instances are working on the same input file, now the output will also be written into the same file that is one dot out. Now the problem here is this guy is also writing to the same file and this guy also. Now there are high likely chances that this file gets corrupted. Once this guy, this file, this output file is corrupted, it is totally unusable. Now we have already used two machines to process the same file and end of the day, we also got the corrupted output and this is real bad. That's what we are trying to solve, the integrity, okay? That means that the only solution to solve this problem is to lock this file. As soon as this guy picks up this file, he should lock this file that I have, I'm using it. So this guy comes in to pick up the same file, but this guy will get to know that someone has locked this file, so he must be processing. What he does is he will instead pick up this file or this file or any other files which is uh, unlocked. So everything works fine. And also, since this file is not processed by multiple machines, it, there are no chances that the output file will get corrupted. So the only solution is lock. And now you must be thinking, yeah, we can just use simple lock and then solve this problem. Okay, I know what you guys are thinking. So we have one machine, okay, where this machine, when it picks up a file, he also makes an entry in the database or a file or anywhere. I'm going to where is this? say I1 adds an entry into the database that he is working on one dot data. And when this guy comes in, he also does the same thing. I2 is working on two dot data. And when this guy comes in, he checks, is anyone working on three dot data over here? And then if it is free, he picks up and then works and also adds an entry here, I3 three dot data. And everything works fine again. But what if, what if this machine goes down? Again, we have the same problem. The efficiency problem comes into the picture and integrity also comes into the picture. That means that we have added single point of failure. This machine, if it goes down, again, all of this data is corrupted. What if it takes one day to process one file? Say we are making like some machine learning model. Say, for example, we are running some RNN or some image classification, uh, something like, um, so one day, worth of competition is gone. We don't want this log to be single point failure. And also if you use database, it will be, um, you know, it will not be that efficient because there are too many writes and reads. Database is not that efficient. Instead, we can actually use uh, in-memory systems, something like Redis or Memcache. Basically, we are trying to use cache over here. And again, when this instance fail, we again, it's the same problem. For that, what we need to do is we need to distribute this lock system as well. Basically, we have uh, more machines which are actually working for the same purpose, that is for the purpose of locking. So we should have a lock manager where we have one or more machines which are running and it also replicates the same data here, okay? Maybe asynchronously. So every guy comes to this, this machine, 
um, and then adds an entry. And asynchronously, we are actually syncing the data back to its slaves, something like slave, right? As soon as um, this guy adds an entry, um, he picks up the files and starts to work. And also this information is slowly replicated back to the slaves or the other machines. Um, say, I one dot, this information is replicated and this information is replicated and this information is replicated. Or maybe we, we can even think like this machine is placed somewhere near to Africa and this machine is placed somewhere near Asia. What problem we, um, we face now is because these machines are also now far away, they're not in same data center. It, it, will, it will take a lot of time to uh, sync the information between these machines. There's, there's no single point of truth. If you have one machine, the problem is single point of failure. If you have multiple machines which are asynchronously synchronizing the information which are written to them, there is no single uh, source of truth. How do we tackle all of this problem? Say, for example, if this machine goes down and if this information is still not replicated, the same problem might occur. More machines come in and they, they see that um, since this machine is down, they might connect into this machine and then they see that no entries are there because this machine went down even before this information was sent. And again, we, we face the same problem. We face the efficiency problem and we also face the integrity problem. All of these problems are there. So we have to design our system in a way it, uh, it actually answers all of the problems I just mentioned. Before designing our distributed log, we also need to define the properties our log. First one is mutual exclusion or mutex. We don't want two or more threads or processes or instance to acquire the same log. And the second one is deadlock free. We don't want our systems to wait for log which the opposites are holding. We don't want faults to happen. That means that our system should be fault tolerant. As I have already explained, to uh, eliminate the single point of failure or to make the system fault tolerant, we included more number of uh, Redis nodes, right? Now, the problem is these nodes are distributed. Also, the sync is happening via sync. What if this machine goes down, the information is not available. What if we don't have these machines? It's a single point of failure. There might chances of violating the mutual exclusion and also there might be possibility of deadlock. We don't want anything to happen this way. So what we're going to do is we will design our system in such a way it should adhere to all of these properties which we have defined. Now, instead of building the entire system at once, let's take it a little slowly and then see the different problems, understand, and then we evolve the system. Now, for the initial design, we have lock manager, we have cache, we can, we can have DB also. The only reason which we are using cache, as I mentioned, is to have faster read and write. And we have two instances which are trying to acquire locks and release the locks because these guys are working on something which it needs locks. Say for example, now the instance one tries to get a lock. He sends a request to the lock manager. I need a lock, okay? And this guy returns the lock, but before doing that, he has to place a lock into the cache. What he does is he writes the information into the cache, say lock. And then he goes back and then gives the lock to this instance one. And it's good. He is working, working, working. And once the work is finished, he will come back and then says to the lock manager, my work is finished. Please remove the lock. He will remove the lock now. Okay. And now this instance and all the instruction, instructions are finished. And when this instance comes and asks the lock manager, and the same thing happens. He goes and then he gets and he locks it and then he turns back. And everything is working fine. We still have the problem of single point of failure. We will solve that later. Now, let's talk about other scenarios as well. Consider this guy has acquired the lock. Now, he goes back and then writes a value or a key lock. So we know that there is someone has acquired. When this guy goes and asks to lock manager before even this instance releases the lock, he can't give it. He says that, no, you can't get a lock. Please wait. Obviously, this guy waits and then he comes back and then still the lock is not available and he goes back and then he comes back and then the same thing happens. What if this guy is taking so much time to finish some job 
that he's not even releasing the log. It's not good because not just one instance, if you have more instances in our system, everyone will be busy. We can't just make, um, make one system to acquire that log. So what we do is let's put a, let's do one thing instead of just mentioning log, since it is cached, we can always specify the TTL. Let's change our code in the log manager to also specify the TTL. Say, for example, we specify maximum of five seconds, a lock can be held to a specific instance. Now the same thing works well. This guy asks the lock and then he gets it and he's working now. Even though if he doesn't release the lock within five seconds, the lock will be automatically released by the system. So this lock is vanished after five seconds and anyone can later access the lock even if this guy didn't release and everything is fine now. But there are other problems. Okay, now that we learned, we need TTL to ensure our locks are proper. So I'm going to mention all the features here. That is, we need TTL that we have already told the lock manager to put the TTL. So now let's go for the second scenario. So this guy acquires the lock, he requests and then acquires the lock. So now we have TTL also set. Now he's working in between this guy comes in and then asks for the lock. Now the lock is given to the instance one, so he won't get it. And after fifth second, he comes back and asks, give me the lock. Since five seconds has already elapsed and this guy hasn't released the lock, obviously this lock would have vanished. And this lock manager sees that, yeah, lock has not given to anyone. So he would obviously give it to lock and five, he gives it to instance two. So this guy has got the lock. This guy still hasn't removed the lock. After maybe seventh second, this guy finishes his job and then he goes back to the lock manager and he says, release the lock. What this guy does is blindly he releases the lock, which was acquired by instance two, and that is bad. Now, after seven seconds, the lock has released, right? And anyone can come and acquire now because the lock is with this guy and he's still processing. Now there are high chances that our system might perform inefficiently or there might be data corruption. Now we can't just have lock. We need to have a protective mechanism to do that. What we can actually do is, instead of just mentioning lock, we can use time or we can use unique ID to mention the lock, um, to create the lock. Say for example, instead of just mentioning lock, we can have lock underscore say one and five second TTL, okay? One means that lock one is acquired here. So whenever he tries to release, he will obviously, the lock manager should check, is the same lock which is locked. And if it is, then only I will release. Say, well, let's repeat the same scenario and see whether we are safe or not. He, he, he requests the lock and the lock manager locks and then he locks with the name lock underscore one he says that your lock name is lock underscore one so he goes back with lock underscore one obviously this guy is a little slow he will take more than five seconds so in between if this guy comes and asks for lock he says no it is locked i can't give you the lock obviously he goes back five seconds has elapsed and this guy hasn't come back to unlock it this guy comes, this guy checks, is the lock available? So obviously this would have vanished after five seconds. So he says that, yeah, lock has been, um, yeah, lock is available and you can take it. Now this guy will give a different lock than before because he can't give the same lock. Now he will give lock underscore two. And he also says lock underscore two with five second TTL. Now lock underscore two is available with this guy. And after seventh second, I mean, since two seconds has elapsed and this guy after five seconds means two seconds, he has taken extra. So at seven seconds, he comes back and then says, that, says to the lock manager, please release the lock. And he tries to release the lock, lock one. Since that lock one is not even there, he will not do anything. He says that you are late and I'm not supposed to release the lock. And then everything is fine. So... This guy still has the lock two and no one can get that lock. Lock two is still there and after five seconds, it will automatically elapse. Or if this guy finishes the job even before five second TTL or timeout, he will go back and then says that release the lock two and then he will obviously release the lock two and it 
is working fine. And all these problems are solved. Now, one more feature we need to add is add unique number with, along with the lock. That way we have a unique lock created every time. But the problem is who will give the unique ID? So how do we generate random number? Say the random number generation will not happen on the instance side. It should happen on the lock manager side. Consider lock manager generated a random number. What if on worst case, we got same random number two times and after timeout, he came back and to the lock manager and says that, please release the lock. Unfortunately, there are times when that can happen. So it's not safe to do that way also. What we can actually use is we can use something like coordination um, services like Zookeeper, which um, maintains, which can give uh, different numbers, random numbers or a range of numbers without conflicting. But the, but the problem is we don't want to run the Zookeeper or some other coordination server just for the lock manager. So instead what we can do is uh, simply instead of um, taking a random number, we can take time up to say micro second precision. So when we take epoch time, for example, with microseconds precision, most likely since we have a, a single lock manager, we won't get the duplicates. So that our lock is kind of safe or is it safe? It's kind of safe. Let's take, if not microsecond, we can take maybe nanosecond precision. So it is still safe. For now, let's take our time precision to, um, you know, millisecond. Okay. So we have the time millisecond and when we are locking, instead of having a unique number, we just use the time millisecond, say lock, have a epoch time or time with millisecond recorded in here. So we have a unique um, <clears throat> in a lock created for every time when the instances are asking to lock. So that way when the instances comes back with the lock name, we can just compare whether the instance came back with the same lock and then we can remove or not, okay? Now, all of these problems are solved, but how about the problem of a single point of failure? Now, all of these problems are solved. Now, how about the problem of single point of failure or how do we make our system fault tolerant? For that, as we earlier discussed, we need to have multiple you know, lock managers and this combination will say something like, this itself is one uh, lock manager instance. So we need to have multiple of them. So let's do one thing. Let's say we have few more, say one, two, three. So we have lock manager two, lock manager three, lock manager four, lock manager five. To make our system work well, what we do is, let's say our lock manager is all in the same data center. This machine or any machine who tries to acquire lock, instead of acquiring in only one machine, instead he goes to multiple machine and acquire lock from all of these machines. So he, he asked to give me give the lock from this machine. He also asked lock manager two instance to give the lock. He also asked this machine, this machine, and that machine. So basically he is asking all of the five different instances to give the lock. Only if he gets five locks, that means that he has got the lock and he can proceed with the work. And when he releases also, he has to tell all of these five instances to release the law. And the same mechanism happens, setting the timeout, setting the unique number, and that we took it as a time with millisecond resolution. Um, so lock and release actually happens in all of the five machines. But the problem again here is, we have hard-coded it to have five locks. What if one machine goes down? So we only get four locks at most, so we can't proceed with the work. So to solve that problem, Instead of taking lock from all of the machine, let's configure our instance to acquire lock to n by two plus one. That means that more than half of the machines, say we have five machine, that means that we should acquire at least n by two is like 2.5 
let's take okay at least three machines that is like reaching to the quorum or reaching reaching to the maximum modes so any machine who wants to acquire lock should get three locks from any of these five machines it's fine it's not this machine or this machine any of these five machine if this machine wants to acquire he needs to get three votes say for example if you have six machines then how many votes we need to get six by two is three three plus one is uh, four so we need to get four votes to proceed with our work now how the system is fault tolerant now the good thing over here is any of these any machines out of these this cluster of machines can go down we just need to always look for n by two plus one that's it of the machines which are alive say for example two machines went down that means this machine went down and this machine went down it's fine we still have four machines anytime we'll check how many machines are available so that is n by two that is four by two is two two plus one is three so we'll need to at least acquire three locks to proceed with our work so I just forgot to mention one consideration when you're actually using time millisecond along with the lock. Uh, two things you need to remember. Uh, since we are using so many machines, uh, the cluster of machines just for the lock manager itself, every instance is trying to acquire n by 2 plus 1 machines. That means that every machine should have same date and time. Okay. If one machine has some one second delay or some millisecond um, offset that means that not all of the four locks which are acquired doesn't will not be of the same lock lock underscore the same time right so we we should have all of these machines um tuned to um tuned to give the same date and time to the precision of millisecond but one more, and also one more thing is when, say, for example, if this instance is trying to acquire, say, four locks, maybe he's making a parallel call, uh, I mean, concurrent calls to all of these machines out of which he is trying to get four locks. Not always that the request will go at the same time. So not exactly every time, uh, time underscore millisecond will be exact time. There can be little um, difference, right? So... We also should consider that all of these four lock um, have a some some millisecond tolerance. Even if the locks are off by some millisecond, then it's fine. It's it's like we have got the lock. I think this is the higher level idea of how we can actually develop uh, you know distributed locks. And there are so many different algorithms. Uh, there is Chubby algorithm by Google and there is um, there are tons of algorithms however this is one way to tackle this problem and I just wanted to give you guys the idea of how we can solve this problem I think yeah this is a short video I think yeah I've reached to the end of the video and there are so many libraries available from Redis itself it's called as Redlock you can you guys can go and try that algorithm if you want and um, yeah this is the end of the video and as usual if you guys like the video please like subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends and um, yeah comment and give suggestions if you have any thank you